Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Stephen Lindner and in this uh, short video we're going to be talking about muscle and primarily muscle function, muscle physiology, how do muscles contract, some of the properties of muscle. So let's just review some of the basic uh, functions of muscle tissue. Now when we think of muscle, we know that there are three types of muscle. We know there's skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. But what we're going to be focusing on is skeletal muscle. So when skeletal muscles contract, they have the ability of producing body movements. How is that possible? When muscles contract, they create tension. And when that tension is created in the muscle, they're transmitted into the tendons. And think of where tendons attach, tendons attach to bones. So when muscles create their contractile force, they transmit it to the tendons, the tendons transmit it to the bone, and the bone moves. When muscles contract, they also have the ability to stabilize the body. And that's because you heard me use the word contract, and contract really means creating tension. And you can create tension in muscle without movement at all. Think of someone doing a plank at a gym, right? Doing a static contraction to strengthen their core muscles by doing a plank that is just a stabilizing type of contraction. Okay, what else can muscles do? Uh, muscles are involved in storing and mobilizing substances within the body. Well, they can store things like glucose. And glucose in the storage form is called glycogen. And anything that ends in ogen means it's inactive. So glycogen is just the storage form of glucose, which is sugar. And we know that glucose in high amounts could be very toxic to the body. So the body doesn't want it floating around in its toxic form. So we'll put it in storage in the form of glycogen. We could store it in muscle and we can store it in the liver. Those are the two places that glucose is stored, in the muscles and in the liver, and it's stored in the form of glycogen. Okay. So just remember, anything that ends in ogen means it's inactive. When you get into digestion uh, in anatomy and physiology too, you'll learn about certain digestive enzymes like pepsin and pepsinogen. So you're going to hear the pepsinogen, ogen meaning it's inactive. Um, when we cover the endocrine system in another week, we'll talk about uh, the RAS system, which involves angiotensinogen. And again, we're hearing the term ogen which means it's inactive. Okay, um, so it's involved in storage and mobilizing substances. The reason being is when muscles contract, they act as like a pump. So they can pump and move substances through the blood. Okay? And when muscles contract, they have the ability of generating heat. We know this is true because if you exercise and your muscles are contracting, your body generates heat, you get hot, and you sweat to cool off your body. We know that if you have a fever and your hypothalamus in your brain is trying to generate more heat to increase your fever, but it can't, then you go into a febrile seizure, which is your muscles going into spasm. And by having your eyes roll back and your muscles go into this quivering fit called a seizure, that rapid, strong muscle contraction is enough to increase body temperature. 
So it's a good thing when that happens. It's a really good thing. Okay, it's your body trying to maintain homeostasis by killing, raising the body temperature to kill off viruses and bacteria. Which brings up a good point. You know, many people, when they have a fever, and if you have children, many people get worried if their child has a little bit of a fever and they want to give their child aspirin and Tylenol, and you have to be really, really careful because of a condition called Reyes syndrome, R-E-Y-E-S. You have to be very, very careful giving those types of medication uh, to young, young children. Um, I often ask my students, well, what do you think a high temperature is? When do brain cells start to die? And people will take an aspirin or a Tylenol with 103, 104, even 105. And believe it or not, it's safe to get up to about 107.9. And somewhere around there, that's where brain cells start to uh, become uh, hurt or can die off. So you want to uh, be aware of that, not rush right away to take aspirin or Tylenol at 104, 105. This is the body's mechanism to fight off bacteria and viruses. So when I bring this number to people, they're like, whoa, you know, they had no idea. They thought it was much, much less. Some of the properties of muscle tissue, uh, muscles are electrically excitable. Uh, they are electrically excitable because we have a neuron that can attach to muscle. Okay, so let's say this is muscle tissue right here. And this is a neuron that's going to attach to it, right? And right here where they attach... We call that the neuromuscular junction, the NMJ, the neuromuscular junction. It's where the nerve and the muscle meet. And as a result of that, muscles are electrically excitable. Muscles have the ability to contract. They have the ability to extend. And muscles are elastic. They should have the ability to recoil and rebound back. Okay. Now, we don't want muscles or tendons being stretched beyond their anatomical limits. When you have muscles and tendons that are stretched beyond their anatomical limits, then we call that a strain. When you have ligaments that stretch beyond their anatomical limit, we call it a sprain with a P. But a strain with a T involves muscles and tendons. And sometimes if the stretch is so severe, then a muscle or tendon can rip off of a bone, a complete rupture. Okay, and that requires a surgical repair. Remember, tendons do have blood supply, may not be the best. So whenever you have strains, it can take a little bit of time for them to heal due to the blood supply that goes to it. Okay. The one of the most common muscles, especially in the shoulder, to go through uh, injuries is called a supraspinatus. It's one of the rotator cuff muscles. The rotator cuff muscles we call sits, S I T S. And the first S is for supraspinatus. The I is for infraspinatus. The T is for teres minor. And the last S is for subscapularis. So supraspinatus uh, is commonly strained and even commonly damaged um, and even torn as the rota rotator cuff muscle that's most commonly involved. One of the most common ruptures for tendons would be the Achilles tendon. The Achilles which is Greek, uh, the proper way to say this in Greek would be Achilleas, Achilleas, which is Achilles, the Achilles tendon. Um, very commonly ruptured. Um, you have to be careful and do extensive research, especially when using antibiotics. There are many antibiotics on the market 
that create tendinopathies. Tendinopathies just means pathology to tendons. One of the types of pathologies is a ruptured tendon. So you really want to be careful with that. Okay, pretty common. Okay, uh, let me stop um, there and I will create another video talking about the different types of contractions.